So we're moving to chapter 17 of the prophecy now and we're going to witness some amazing events which we consider in this chapter in the light of what's happening particularly in Europe today. Um, just to set the scene though, we're in the section of the prophecy, uh, we've called it chapter 17 to 19 here, where we've got the judgment of the great whore on the one hand and the triumph of the lamb and his bride on the other. And, and that's, that's the overall section that we're considering. Um, if we break that down a little bit, we've got in chapter 17 that we're going to be looking at now, the description of this system throughout history and its future judgment. That's what we've got in chapter 17. And then in chapters 18 and 19, we've got that system destroyed and we've got the triumph of the Lamb and the marriage of the Lamb uh, in chapter 19. So we read in verse 1 of chapter 17, There came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me. This obviously was the angel that poured out the seventh vial. We read in chapter 16 and verse 17 that the seventh angel poured out his vial into the air. And it's presumably this same angel which is talking with John here in chapter 17 of the prophecy. What this angel says to John is, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore. We read also in this chapter, The woman which thou sawest is that great city. So on the one hand it's a symbolic woman, but it's also a symbolic city, and they are one and the same. It's the whore and it's Babylon the great. We read the waters which thou sawest, where the whore sitteth, she was sitting on the beast, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. So if we put these ideas together, what we can see here is that the many waters, the beast and the nations of Europe are all one and the same. So we've got the papacy described in symbol as the woman and also the great city Babylon. The beast, or the waters, the nations of Europe. The horns on the beast are the kings of the earth, i.e. the leaders in Europe. Just coming back to basics again, we are in... The prophecy of Daniel here, chapter 2 and chapter 7. We've seen this before. We're looking at that fourth beast that Daniel saw in chapter 7, which equates with the legs and the feet of the image. And as we saw last time, if we draw a line in that prophecy, everything below it is expanded for us in the apocalypse. So it's the fourth beat of Daniel 7, which we see in its different phases when we go through the book of Revelation. So just to go through these different phases, Daniel saw the Roman beast in all its phases until it was eventually destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ. John sees it first of all as the beast coming out of the sea in chapter 13. And then he sees it as the beast of the earth. That's the two-horned beast, which equates to the Holy Roman Empire. But we are considering here the final phase of that power, the scarlet beast uh, in chapter 17 that we're considering here. We saw also last time these seven points of reference we're not going to go through them all again, but it shows us beyond any doubt really that what Daniel saw and what John sees in Revelation uh, are describing the same thing. And many of these things we've got in chapter 17. The mouth speaking blasphemies, for example, that makes war with the saints and overcomes them. And how that eventually that power is destroyed. The Lamb shall overcome them. We read in chapter 17 and verse 14. And then of course eventually 
it's cast into the lake of fire, burning with brimstone. That's chapter 19 of the prophecy. So, this woman commits fornication with the kings of the earth. A quote here from Wikipedia which summarises the whole thing really. It says, The Holy Roman Empire, that's the beast of the earth of Revelation 13, was an attempt to revive the Western Roman Empire, which was the first beast that crops up in chapter 13, the beast of the sea. We read, The Roman Imperial Office, that is of the Western Empire, had been vacant after Romulus Augustulus was deposed in 476. But during the turbulent early Middle Ages, the popes had kept alive the traditional concept of a temporal or secular realm coexistive with a spiritual realm, or that is, of the Church. And that quote is telling us really that what we say here is the aim of the papacy has always been to mix church and state together. In other words, as the prophecy says, to commit fornication with the kings of the earth. And the papacy has always needed the kings of the earth for a military power so that it could fight the battles uh, as the papacy required. Here's one example. How the kings of the earth came to witness the funeral of John Paul. And this is a National Catholic reporter speaking here. They say, Behind the casket, the College of Cardinals sat clad in crimson robes, but we read later on, opposite them sat an audience of equal proportion that included kings, queens, presidents, prime ministers from the secular world. It's a good example, isn't it, of how that this system has committed fornication with the kings of the earth. Here's another example. Back in 2004, the Pope received the Charlemagne Prize for promoting European unity. So there we've got the papacy once again, right at the centre of it, the centre of the affairs in Europe and he'd won this prize uh, given to him here by the Mayor of Aachen. And then we read, The inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Just a couple of examples here. First of all, this article that appeared in the Times back in 2005 William Rees Mogg says, Are we fools led by liars? He says, The EU constitution makes tough reading, but its meaning and its danger couldn't be clearer. Whenever one dips into the constitution, one is liable to sink into a bog of unexamined propositions. I cannot think of any document of comparable historic importance which raises so many questions or answers so few. So here we've got the EU constitution that's been described here, which has been put forward by the kings of the earth in collaboration with the harlot. But he goes on to say, nevertheless, the constitution does two things which allow one to answer the question. First of all, it creates a state, and secondly, the Constitution shall have primacy over the laws of member states. And we'll say more about that uh, later. Here's another example of how the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. We go right back to the Jesuit Ribera and his theory of a future Antichrist that will appear at the time of the end. He will persecute and blaspheme the saints of God. That, by that he means the Roman Catholic Church. He will rebuild the temple in Jerusalem, abolish their religion, be received by the Jews, pretend to be God and conquer the world. 
and we can see how we, how these ideas are preparing the nations to fight the Lord Jesus Christ when he comes. We say here the nations of Europe, drunk with paper wine, will fight the Messiah when he comes. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet coloured beast. And as we've seen, it's the, it's the final phase of the Roman beast that Daniel saw. And it's not too difficult to identify the system today when we start looking around. There we see the two euro coin minted by Greece in 2002 and the woman is on the beast there. A German magazine. Their woman of course is the Greek goddess Europa but they are using the same symbology that the scriptures use to describe their system. Here it is again with Time magazine. Or if we go to their headquarters, there's the woman once again riding the beast right outside their headquarters in Brussels. So verse 4 tells us the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet colour and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. Now this is quite interesting but it looks as it's almost as though they're trying to ape the true religion but they are of course the counterfeit religion. If we go back to the garments of the high priest as recorded in Exodus 28 we read here they shall make the ephod of gold, of blue, of purple, of scarlet and fine twined linen. And we've just read up with the woman was arrayed in purple, scarlet colour, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls. And we read in chapter 18, she was clothed in fine linen. There's one colour that's conspicuous by its absence, is there not? It's the blue. And blue was took a very prominent role in the garment of the high priest. Thou shalt make the robe of the ephod all of blue. And it, let's just turn to Roman uh, Numbers chapter 15, shall we? And we're in there at verse, well, th verse 37. The Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, and bid them that they make them fringes in the borders of their garments throughout all their generations. So this is not just the high priest. This is all the children of Israel throughout their generations and they were to put on upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue and the next verse tells us why it shall be unto you for a fringe that ye may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord to do them and that ye seek not after your own heart and your own eyes after which he used to go a-whoring, that ye may remember and do all my commandments and be holy unto your God. Which, of course, the Roman Catholic system can never be. So it's not surprising that the blue is missing because they do not remember the commandments of Yahweh, the God of Israel. We remember that on the high priest's forehead it said holiness to Yahweh, holiness to the Lord. And what did it say on the forehead of this woman? Mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. She had a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication.
Now we're back here with Babylon of old. And there's the woman with the cup. And this is taken from Hislop's Two Babylons. He says, The purpose of the beverage in the cup was to dim the understanding and excite the passions, to make the people drunk, in other words. And there's a coin struck by Pope Leo XII. And on the reverse side of that we can see once again the woman uh, holding the cup. Upon her forehead was a name written. First of all, mystery. This is current Catholic teaching. The Trinity is a mystery of faith in the strictest sense. One of the mysteries that are hidden in God which can never be known unless they are revealed by God. But his innermost being as a trinity is inaccessible to reason alone or even to Israel's faith before the incarnation of God's Son and the sending of the Holy Spirit. I think they're talking there about the Old, Test Old Testament. So whether it's Old Testament or New, the trinity, they say, is a mystery. If we turn to the writings of the Apostle Paul, um, to Timothy, First uh, Timothy, and chapter um, three, and at verse sixteen, we read there that without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up into glory. And the Lord Jesus Christ was, of course, the manifestation of God. So the mystery was made plain, in other words. And in Scripture, we, we see whenever there is a mystery, it is revealed. It's a revealed mystery. As opposed to the Catholic, they have these mysteries that no one can understand. And that's what they're saying in that quote. Mystery, Babylon the Great. Until we go back to Babylon of old again. We read here, at the apex of the Sumerian Babylonian pantheon of gods was a trinity. So that's where it's come from in the beginning. It's come from Babylon of old. And spiritual Babylon has taken on the, the same ideas. In that same book, we read here dis, dis, a depiction of a triune God worshipped in ancient Assyria. And Hislop tells us, according to the genius of the mystic system of Chaldea, so there's the mystery again, which to a large extent was founded on double meanings. That which to the eyes of man in general was only a circle, was to the initiated understood to signify the seed. First there is the head of the old man, then the seed, and lastly the wings and tail of a bird or dove. And that was their trinity. And we see this idea, it was only the initiated that understood these things. And we've got the idea here, of, haven't we, of clergy and laity. It said on her forehead, Mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. They tell us themselves that they are the Mother Ecclesia, as depicted here in St. Peter's Square in Rome. And then John says, I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. We could spend a long while on this. Let's just look at two examples of how 
she is drunken with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Here's an example from Fox's Book of Martyrs. A bookseller burnt with two Bibles round his neck for selling them in Avignon. So they didn't like the scriptures, you see. And anyone who was trying to uh, put the scriptures into the hands of the people, that's what happened to them. He was burned at the stake. Or as another terrible example here in this engraving showing the slaughter of Protestant children in front of their distressed parents. And we, we know, don't we, that there was the rack, there was the thumbscrew and the terrible torture methods that they used um, throughout the dark ages of their history. And then verse 8 says, the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition. So let's go through that slowly. The beast that thou sawest was, John was told, he'd already seen it, as the beast of the sea and the beast of the earth, but now he's considering the final phase of that beast. And then it was, and it is not. See, those phases have been destroyed. The sea beast, when the Goths ruled the western part of the empire from Rome, and also when Napoleon brought an end to the Holy Roman Empire. And twice the beast was not, it was destroyed. But it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit. And we see that happening today before our very eyes, emerging from the abyss of Europe. But eventually, it will go into perdition. That's at the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. That phrase, bottomless pit, it simply means the abyss. Now here we've got an example of how, once again, unwittingly, they are using the same symbols and, and, and statements as the prophecy. Here's a display outside the EU Parliament building back in 2012. They just won the Nobel Peace Prize. They were celebrating 60 years of peace. So all those posters that we see there are depicting all the wars which have taken place in Europe. But they are saying, but now we are coming out of the abyss. The Europeans build peace together. It's quite remarkable, isn't it, that they've used the same symbol. We are rising out of the abyss, is what they are saying. And they've received this prize, 60 years of peace in our continent. And that's what this is all about. So the beast that thou sawest was and is not. It was as the sea beast. It was as the earth beast. But on both occasions it was destroyed. Suddenly it was not. But it shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, which is happening now, and it will go into perdition at the return of the Lord. So there we see the same thing, just using a timeline here, looking at the different phases of this beast. And we read in that same verse, They that dwell on the earth shall wonder, they will marvel or admire, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world, when they behold the beast that was and is not, and yet is. They will marvel how that this uh, system in Europe it is putting itself together again as it was so long ago but those who are written in the Lamb's Book of Life is no surprise to them because they've read the prophecy and they understand exactly what's happening so John was told 
Here is the mind which hath wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sitteth. Couldn't be clearer, could it? The seven hills of Rome. And this is taken from a tourist brochure. Uh, if you want to go to Rome, you can actually go and see the seven hills of Rome. So there's another point of identification of this system. And then John was told, there are seven kings, five or four and one is, i.e. when John received the vision, and the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. So what we're saying is, these kings relate to the seven heads and the ways in which Rome has been governed over the centuries. The word king here, Basilius, it is from the root basis through the notion, notion of foundation of power, Strong tells us. So the ways in which Rome has been governed, and this is well documented in history, first of all, they had a king. It was a regal uh, system. Then it was consular, dictator, that was only a short period, but nevertheless it was ruled by a dictator. And then there was the ten men, the disenviral uh, form of government, the war generals exercising political power, and that gave way eventually to just one general taking power for life, the imperial, and Julius Caesar was the first one of them. So there we've got six of the heads, six forms of government, and the seventh was different to the first six. It was when the Goths controlled the empire, and they did it for just 60 years. So if we put this back into a timeline, John was told there are seven kings, five are fallen, and we just looked at them. One is, that was the imperial. When John was given the vision, there was one form in, in vogue. And the other is not yet come. And when he cometh, he must continue a short space. And that was the Gothic head. When the Goths ruled, as we've said, for just 60 years, he must continue a short space. Right, think about this beast that was and is not. He, he, we read here, he is the eighth, but he is of the seven and goeth into perdition. So let's just go through the timeline again of the different phases of the Roman beast. We read in chapter 13 that one of his heads was, as it were, wounded to death, but that deathly wound was healed. And all the world once again wandered after the beast. So the imperial head was the one that was wounded to death. When the Goths controlled the empire for this relatively short period of time. So the Gothic, which was anti-papal, they were there for just 60 years. But then the wound was healed as it were. And we are back to an imperial head. And the emperors ruled the empire once again during the period of the holy roman empire but that was brought to an end by napoleon it was as wounded to death yet again uh, by napoleon in relatively recent times but the head that has appeared now that the prophecy is speaking about in this chapter it's the eighth head but really it belongs to the seven. It's the same story all over again. It's the papacy and the kings of the earth. So that's why it says it is of the seven. And of course it will go into perdition.
The ten horns which thou sought are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but receive power as kings one hour with the beast. Now that phrase one hour could mean just at the same time as read really there in Matthew 18. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus saying who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So it's sometimes translated in that way speaking about all at the same time or it might mean a specific time. Here we've got an example from the same uh, gospel speaking about the 11th hour and that is actually obviously speaking about on our 60 minutes as we would say of time. So it could be either of these. If it's the latter what we're saying is an hour is one twelfth of a day and so using the day for a year principle we end up with a period of 30 years which we might see in the future when these kings have power with the beast for this period of time that remains to be seen but we know that these shall make war with the lamb and the lamb shall overcome them for he is lord of lords and king of kings and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful so there's the climax of this part of the prophecy that system will be destroyed. The Lamb will overcome them. And we pray, don't we, that we might be with him in that day, those who are called and chosen, and that we may remain faithful. Now we come to verse 12. We read, The ten horns which thou sought are ten kings which have received no kingdom as yet, but received power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And here we've got something which is almost unique in history. Let's go back to 1959, shall we? The European Economic Commission is responsible for the assembly of the community. It defends the common interests of the community and represents the community viewpoint rather than national views it acts by majority vote in all things move on a bit to 1970 economic and monetary union means that the principal decisions of economic policy will be taken at community level and therefore that the necessary powers will be transferred from the national plane to the community plane they will give their power and strength to the beast. Verse 14 says, They will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of Lords and King of Kings. And that is expanded in chapter 19. There's a couple of verses from chapter 19. I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies gathered together to make war against him that sat on the horse, that's the lamb, and against his army. And the beast was taken, and within the false prophet that wrought miracles, these both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And there once again we've got the end result of this part of the prophecy. So what do we make of chapter 17 and verse 16? The ten horns which thou sawest upon the beast, these shall hate the whore, and shall make her desolate and naked, and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. Now we're looking once again at the same timeline that we've seen before, and the different phases of this power. First of all, the sea beast. And that had ten horns, and the horns were crowned. When we move to the next phase of the beast, it had just two horns. So obviously we're not speaking about that phase. And then we've got this final phase, the scarlet beast. Ten horns, but the horns were not crowned. So 
it could be the first phase or it could be the last phase. I make, make the point here that the horns were crowned. They were in power, as it were, on this sea beast eventually. Now, we read in verse 3 that the woman actually controlled the beast. So we say, well, that doesn't sit very well with the idea that the horns are going to destroy the woman. We know that this phase of the beast is, described, is destroyed by the Lord Jesus Christ, as both Daniel and the Revelation tells us. We read in chapter 18 of the prophecy that the kings, that's the horns, lament the whore's destruction. So once again, that doesn't sit very well with the idea that they uh, destroy her. So what we're saying is, the most likely explanation of this particular verse refers to the destruction of the sea beast upon which the horns were crowned. And looking at it that way, it all seems to fit together. The fact that we've moved back in time a bit here is neither here nor there as far as prophecy is concerned. He's just making this point that at one stage the horns destroyed the woman as they did uh, when the Goths ruled over the empire. So we're into verse 17 now. For God hath put in their hearts to fulfil his will and to agree and give their kingdom to the beast. So we've got the president in 2007. He says we are a very special construction, unique in the history of mankind. We are 27 countries that fully decided to work together and to pool their sovereignty. He wasn't done by war, they agreed to work together. And that's what the prophecy is telling us. And here's another quote. He says, Today I want to look at what we are, have done together. We suffered the debt crisis together. We realised we had to fight it together. We have improved the way governments work together. We are tackling our challenges together. And this is the address of Barroso at, at the EU back in 2013. And here's the president, the present president, um, Juncker. He says, we are setting up a permanent, but it's voluntary, defence force, which gets its resources from those member countries which choose to join us. We're not forcing anyone here. They are agreeing to give their kingdom to the beast. That is, until... The words of God should be fulfilled. And if we go now to chapter 19 of the prophecy, we read what the words of God are concerning the fulfilment of this uh, power. So, Revelation 19, and we read at verse 14. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, clean and white, and out of his mouth goes a sharp sword which hath, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness, fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. What a glorious consummation there will be. And we pray once again, do we not, that we might be with the Lord Jesus Christ in that day when this wicked system will be destroyed once and for all and when the righteous reign of the Lord Jesus Christ will bathe the earth in peace and the glory of God will be seen throughout the whole earth. 